o'clock and it is six o'clock. So good evening to all the residents of Tempe. And of course, uh, this is focused on 85281. As you know, I go throughout the city um, to the various zip codes and uh, talk to uh, folks and find out what their needs are. Tempe is a very diverse city. So every every neighborhood is unique. So that's why it's so important for me to go to every sing, single zip code. So um, thanks for everyone that's participating. Unfortunately, we had to do a virtual meeting again this evening, but I think we're almost done. Hopefully, fingers crossed that we can start meeting in person. I know I really miss seeing everyone. And uh, I do have some laryngitis, I think is a leftover from COVID. Uh, so I'm hoping that goes away, but I apologize about my voice. Uh, if it's uh, more squeaky than normal. Uh, special thanks also to our guests this evening. We have Jessica Wright, LaVon Lamy, uh, Commander John Thompson, Lieutenant Michael Hayes, and Assistant City Manager or Deputy City Manager Rose and Um It's I have to tell you a little story that uh, Lieutenant Hayes and Rosa and myself used to work in human services back in the day. The three of us did, and um, we had a lot of fun. And, and uh, so it's it's like old home uh, week tonight uh, with with uh, my uh, my fellow colleagues. Um, also, we will be taking questions this evening in the chat room uh, because we are virtual. So we will be taking those questions. If there are any questions that aren't answered, we will follow up with you. So uh, no question is is a bad question. So please feel free to ask whatever you whatever you need. Um, tonight we're going to address homelessness, housing, police. Um, we're gonna hear from the um, deputy Tep, um, city manager, Rosa and Chelsea, and then we're, I'm gonna do my top 10 list. So with that, I will turn it over to Jessica, who is kicking us off this evening. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Councilmember Adams for having us. I appreciate you taking the time to give us the opportunity to showcase, showcase what our team's doing. You bet. I'm, I'm excited to, to hear your presentation. Thank you. With that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that I can get a couple of slides up there for just what we're going to be talking about. All right. So. I'm here to present on the homeless solutions updates. Um, and like I said, I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to be here to on this. Uh, the team that I get to work with uh, is, is working very hard in the community to do our best to really end homelessness for every individual that is experiencing homelessness in the city of Tempe. So just to go over a little bit of information about HOPE, uh, we were established in 2006 with two part-time outreach specialists. Um, Tempe's homeless outreach prevention effort, HOPE, um, has now expanded recently. And we're gonna talk about that just a little bit later, a little bit more in detail. Currently, we have 11 HOPE specialists now, and our HOPE specialists provide street outreach, case management, but most importantly, a direct access to shelter for individuals that are experiencing homelessness. Uh, that is our main goal is to connect individuals experiencing homelessness with shelter and housing. So our team is providing street outreach primarily uh, as their main as their main responsibility throughout the week. We have ongoing engagements with individuals. We know that when we meet folks on the street, whether it's the first time, uh, especially when it's the first time, it is important for us to be building rapport. A lot of times folks are very untrusting with individuals approaching them on the street um, or providers because there's been times that uh, providers may be in the past have not fulfilled their responsibilities or connected them with what they promised. Uh, so our team works really, really hard to build rapport through all sorts of different ways, engaging on the street, offering resources, offering services with an ultimate goal of connecting individuals with shelter and housing. Some of the services that we offer include things like obtaining vital documentation, uh, connecting folks with mental health resources or medical resources, uh, completing housing, uh, housing evaluations and surveys, um, and providing navigation through housing programs. Uh, we, again, most importantly, provide shelter. And our main goal is to 
have enough engagement with an individual that they are willing to say yes and accept shelter services with us. So within the city of Tempe, we're fortunate enough to have had our mayor and council really invest in this initiative. Uh, we're very committed to making homelessness rare, brief, and one time for anybody that's experiencing that in the city. And so with that, we have uh, a non congregate shelter and a temporary transitional housing facility currently within the city of Tempe. Our temporary housing facility uh, where residents have already moved in. They're very, very satisfied with the with the actual conditions and the location uh, and the service that's being offered from that shelter. We're getting a lot of positive feedback. Um, we do have 2 hope outreach specialists providing case management and support at that shelter uh, throughout the week. We have some operational spaces that are still in process and we're anticipating those to be completed within the next upcoming weeks and. Really, that shelter space does maintain occupancy uh, at full capacity because when we have an availability, our hope outreach team is out in the streets speaking with individuals experiencing homelessness and offering those spaces. So when we have an individual or a family even that is experiencing homelessness, we can take them and put them either directly into one of these facilities or one of the other um, available shelter opportunities through partnering nonprofits that Tempe has also chosen to provide funding to. And then in our non congregate shelter, we're just finalizing the operational and programmatic preparation steps so that we can begin filling the 55 rooms that we have available there. Another huge item within our department and our team is our ASU partnership. So this is something that really was finalized and in play starting January 1st. And it allowed us to expand our hope outreach team from 9 members to 11 members and our recruitment process is currently it's in process. We are uh, have some vetted folks that we're excited to be uh, putting through the, the recruitment process at this time. What this also allowed us to do is take a strategic approach to our street outreach. What that means for us is we divided the city of Tempe into four ge geographical zones, each one with a dedicated hope team. Uh, that means that we're going to have a consistent presence in those areas that we have uh, made smaller for these dedicated teams. Uh, basically, this funding has also allowed us to extend our coverage from five days a week to seven days a week so that we have folks doing outreach to individuals experiencing homeless every every day of the week in the city. The major impacts that we're really excited about since January 1st implementation is first off a more even distribution of hope outreach efforts. Like I said, splitting the city into the four geographic zones allows us to have uh, focused efforts in those areas, which often you know it increases the hope presence. Uh, people will see individuals from our hope outreach team throughout the community in the streets um, at bus stops talking with individual individuals and offering to connect them with services um, and ultimately like i said taking them and putting them in shelter when they are willing to accept shelter with us and us having these four dedicated zones also it really helps facilitate more frequent and proactive engagements with individuals that are experiencing homelessness what that means is it gives us more opportunities to build that rapport, to build that trust and to work with individuals to connect them with the resources they need to get into housing or to go and connect into directly into shelter. Um, even just today, I was speaking with a hope outreach uh, specialist who has scheduled an appointment with somebody to take them uh, to get their vital docs, their, their ID so that they are ready to get into housing. Uh, and we're excited that we're going to be able to connect them with that resource this week. One other event that recently happened was the city of Tempe's point in time count. And so that occurred on January 25th and we started bright and early at 530 in the morning and went until about about 12 to 1230 PM. Where we had a great number of volunteers from the community within the city as well, um, who all trained together on 1 of 2 different dates. And then we had the opportunity to canvas the city. Uh, the city, like I said, we split it up into some individual targeted areas so that the entire city was covered. 
uh, multiple teams went out into each of these areas and they spoke with individuals that uh, were, are experiencing homelessness. In 2020, there were 400 individuals that were identified experiencing homelessness in the streets of Tempe. Excuse me, it's, it's just under 400 and I believe 396, so approximately 400. Uh, this year, we were excited to be able to open up the opportunity to have volunteers participate and we were able to do a very thorough count. Uh, we had some preliminary data in real time that we are excited for what we what we saw. Um, the information that we got, it really is informative for our team and we're waiting on some additional in information and data, the finalized numbers to come from MAG in the upcoming weeks. Uh, but the initial data shows only a small increase from the 2020 point in time count of just under 400 individuals. So we're excited to share that information as soon as we receive the finalized numbers. And with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to uh, LaVon Laney and thank you all for your time. And I will stop sharing my screen as well. Okay. Um, just, just curious, Jessica, before we move on, um, can you, like when people don't accept help, because uh, I know sometimes that's the case. Like, well, how do you like how do you approach that? Can you explain that? Absolutely. Uh, we do encounter that often throughout the day, and so what we're doing is those frequent engagements help to build rapport. What we start with sometimes is just checking in on people. Are you okay? You know, how are you doing? Are you hungry? Would you, can we connect you with some food? How about an additional, uh, you know, a blanket or something to help with your immediate needs? And then while we're doing that, we open the conversation up to talking about what their needs are for housing and resources and start to build that conversation. Again, sometimes that doesn't happen on the first conversation. So we're there daily interacting with these folks, sometimes multiple times a day, checking in with them, trying to open that door of conversation for them to be willing to engage with us and be willing to accept the shelter and housing options that we can get them immediately into through us. Well, and aren't you finding that since you guys have divided the city up into four sections that uh, you are able to establish better rapport because the same uh, outreach counselors are going to the, with the same people? Is that is that helping a lot? It is helping. It definitely is help, helping a lot. And we're excited about that partnership and the ability to uh, take the strategic approach in the street outreach that we're doing. You know, more frequent and proactive engagements is exactly what helps connect folks and build that trust for folks to actually say yes and accept shelter and, and move into into housing and ending their homelessness. Very good. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your presentation. I really appreciate it. And then we're going to move to Levon. Is that correct? That's when I yes. have. Okay. All right. Thank you Thank you. If you could stay on for any questions that we that might come up, that would be great. I absolutely uh, will. Okay. All right, Levon, let's turn it over to you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I appear to be having some Wi-Fi issues. So when I turn on my camera, everything starts to stall and static. So um <clears throat> I apologize for that. Um but my name is Levon Lamy. I am one of the deputy directors for human services, but I'm specifically assigned to housing services. Um, and in the housing update, I kind of wanted to break that up a little bit um, so that for one on the housing services side, um, I wanted to make sure that we kind of touched on, you know, housing services and its role in, a, in, in working with hope and um, housing folks who are, are currently homeless. Um, you know, in the, you know, as part of the temporary transitional housing facility and or the non congregate facility um, that the city has as folks are in there and they're receiving um, the supportive services and securing whatever documents may be needed in order to. To get into a more permanent housing solution, um, we do work uh, the housing services staff do work with them in order to. Um, evaluate which of the multiple housing programs. Um, that they may be eligible for. Um, Tempe Housing Services administers nine separate housing programs. The majority of them are federal programs um, and also has connections into some other, some other programs um, throughout the state that are funded by access or you know, depending on um, access or behavioral health, depending on the individual needs. 
Um, so working so that these you know, folks are moved into a more permanent housing solution as appropriate for them. Um, we also do evaluate um, some of the, the housing choice voucher, which definitely is a waitlist program, um, you know, appropriateness for that and make sure that folks are apprised of when that waiting list would be opening our tenant based rental assistance program, which is another one of the programs um, that's focused really on self sufficiency in a 24 month program um, in order to provide subsidy assistance for 24 months. And then you would be, um, you know, kind of in, in a situation to where you would no longer need assistance. So, you know, trying to make sure that we're providing those those longer term permanent housing solutions. Um, for folks as they move move through the process on a broader housing um, item or housing items that we do on a citywide basis. You know, we are um, working with you know the affordable housing impact statements, working with developers as they are you know looking at bringing their projects in. Um, you know, discussing ways that we may or may not be able to include affordable or workforce housing. Um, in their projects, um, you know, if there's funding available through the hometown for all initiative, um, you know, ways that we can help incentivize that. Um, currently, some of our larger projects um, that are going to be coming to fruition um, sooner rather than later are five properties on Apache Boulevard that um, the city has undertaken the environmental clearance process for. Um, which the phase one of that at this time is currently scheduled to be completed in April. Um, these sites would at maximum density, not saying they'll be built to maximum density, but at maximum density could support up to 390 units of additional multifamily housing. Um, those phase ones again are expected to be done in April, which at that point we would then um, move into any phase two or mitigation that may or may not be required um, to get those projects started through the DRC and the building process. So we are working to expedite the development of affordable housing pro uh, units um, with some of these, you know, pre-clearing the land and getting some of those roadblocks out of the way. Um, we are also working through an addition to that has been the recent acquisition um, of the Food City, uh, Food City Plaza on Apache uh, at Dorsey. Um, ultimately, that is looking to be redeveloped into a uh, multifamily, affordable and or workforce. Um, we are starting the process on that property to do the building conditions assessment report um, to determine the overall status of that building. And once we know that overall condition, um, we would be moving forward with you know, that the process to start engaging the community on what that redevelopment would look like. Um, and again, not saying that it would be, but if, you know, at maximum density for that site, that could hold up to an additional 250 to 300 units um, on that site. So all in we have between the units that are in the works with environmental clearances, units that we're processing, um, and starting the starting the process on to get them in a development ready state. Um, there are just under 850 units in development that should be coming online here within the next um, few years. And of course, we are always looking at um, properties parcels um, for you know some type of acquisition um, or incentivization in order to get more units um, up and running and in the inventory um, to help kind of ease some of the, the overall um, availability of housing units. And I'll kind of stop there and see if anybody had any questions or Council Member Adams, was there anything that you wanted me to kind of um, go into more detail on with the overall? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get unmuted. Uh, yes, I have a question, uh, Levon, and uh, maybe Jessica too. Uh, where does North Tempe, north of Rio Salado, fit into the the four zone strategy? Just to explain that to the residents, I think that would be helpful. Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. Um, it 
it is in our north zone of um of Tempe. We have basically the four zones are split into north, east, west, and a downtown ASU zone. Oh, so nor um, northeast, northwest, and then downtown. So that's only three zones. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I might have misspoken. Excuse me. There is okay. a there is a north zone. Okay. And then there is an east zone and a west zone, and as well as a downtown ASU zone. Okay, I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I probably just misunderstood, Jessica. Okay, I think that's important for people to know, like how things are divided up. I didn't even know that, so that's that's really good news. Um, just them. another question about like section eight. Like, um, can people? How does section eight work um, with getting people housed as far as their incomes and things like that? How's that going? So with, so with the housing choice voucher or section eight program, um, you know, it is, it is an income based program. Um, and so a lot of it is, um, oh gosh, let me try to think of how to. So a lot of housing folks depends on what their income is. We have a payment standard that is established based on the fair market rents. Um, those are established by HUD. At the current time, we have received a waiver from HUD and we have moved our payment standards to 119% of the fair market rents, um, which puts us a little bit closer to market than, than what we were um, at just at 100% FMR. We did that intentionally because of the rising rent, uh, rising rents and because we know that it's, it's getting more challenging for folks to find, um, find units. Um, we do have two full time housing navigators whose primary function is to be out in the community, engaging with landlords, explaining the program because housing choice, you know, section 8 housing choice voucher is a voluntary program. Um, so, you know, they're out engaging with landlords, complexes, you know, mom and pop landlords, um, trying to, to, to engage them to, to get them to, to, um. You know, see if they have any interest in in the program and uh, in accepting these vouchers. Um, the other side of that is they also work with um, individuals and families who are not only participants in housing programs, um, but general residents who may either call in, you know, call into human services or you know may have have um, connected with someone um, on city staff, and it's made its way into into housing to where we can help. Um, our housing navigators kind of help point them into directions of units that they are aware of um, that folks might be interested in in going to look at. So we we definitely um, you know we we are doing our best and staff does their best to kind of um, well we don't match but point folks in the direction of units that we're aware of landlords that we know take the units. Um, we we do know that it is getting more difficult um, to find units for a lot of reasons. Um, again, which is why we raised that payment standard to 119% of the fair market rents and are, you know, have the two full time housing navigators and we are looking at bringing in a 3rd part time housing navigator to help reinforce um, that networking and engagement of, of landlords in order to um, make them aware and see if they would be willing to take the units. Um, so, I mean, it, it's, you know, we're, we're addressing the issues. Um, as as best we can and supporting folks as much as possible. Very good. Thank you. Thank you uh, for expanding on that a little bit for us. Um, all right. So with that, we're going to transition now into uh, Commander John Thompson and Lieutenant Michael Hayes uh, for your presentation. So take it away. Thank you, Council Member Adams, very much. Uh, Molly, do you have the presentation, maybe bringing it up here shortly. And we will be uh, working on sharing that screen, but uh, essentially what uh, I want to go into here with myself and Lieutenant Hayes is uh, we want to share the philosophy of the Tempe Police Department uh, as well as, and that of Chief Glover and how we're utilizing personnel and resources to strive towards these goals that we're going to go over. Uh, since Chief Anderson is also on the call, uh, although myself and Lieutenant Hayes will be presenting. And Molly, if you don't mind, uh, let's go to the next slide. 
Excellent. So what you can all see here, this is uh, Chief Glover's the three C's philosophy. Uh, this is what we all use as a paradigm as we're uh, working through uh, decision making and how we're going to address issues within the community. And the first part here is community policing. Uh, I'm sure it's a term that everyone has heard uh, and essentially de defined here. It, we are seeking strategies uh, that rely upon the community police relationship. And, and it's that relationship, that partnership, that is a key word there in order to problem solve together uh, and proactively address issues that arise having to do with crime and the fear of crime. And part of this, and you see there in quotes, is neighborhood policing. Uh, that is essentially aligning officers to geographic areas of the city, uh, geographic uh, beats, so to speak, so that they can focus on their unobligated time within those boundaries and have an opportunity to get to, the, to know their neighbors. Community engagement is another emphasis uh, that Chief Glover wants us to focus on. And as it says there, it's building alliances, uh, working with the community, not just for the community, uh, and realizing that there's an opportunity there that not every contact that the police department has with the community has to be a result of an emergency call for service or a tragedy, uh, and to seek out and find those opportunities for us to, to interact uh, positively with the community uh, to build that uh, trust and legitimacy. And then the last part here is collaborative leader leadership, ensuring the organization is working together constructively uh, to focus on achieving all of the organizational goals that we have and the community goals. So. I'm going to turn it over to the next slide. Um, Molly, if you want to transition to the next slide, and we'll turn it over to Lieutenant Hayes to cover this part. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Mike Hayes. I'm a lieutenant with the police department. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing is, how do you do all this, right? Like, uh, this is a big shift in how we're doing police work, and it's a really great change for our, for our department and for the city. And so some of the things that we've done uh, recently is obviously we've tried to increase that beat officer engagement. And one of the things that we did several years ago, as most of you know, uh, has, was to go from larger zones to smaller beats. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to accomplish in that is have um, kind of like what Councilwoman Arredondo, I mean, I'm sorry, Adams, uh, was saying before about building relationships, about being in smaller areas and being able to meet people and to engage with them and build those relationships, be able to solve uh, root issues uh, rather than um, trying to keep like an enforcement mentality as a, as a problem solving method. So that was one of the big changes we did. The other change we did as uh, Commander Thompson relayed was uh, trying to work towards neighborhood policing strategies. And so our beat officers, our, our expectations for them are to become much more highly visible in those areas uh, to connect with community members, going to um, different events, uh, going to parks, being around the neighborhoods much more. Um, and once again, trying to build those relationships on a daily basis. Those officers uh, are pretty much expected to go look at the chronic issues in their areas uh, and solve problems uh, that are in those areas at the root level and be proactive rather than just being reactive quite a bit. One of the uh, kind of one of the things that we've tried up in the beat 11 in the North Tempe area. Uh, as an example of that is we've assigned officers to each business along Scottsdale Road in a micro beat area, which is a smaller area in beat 11 that has been having issues for a long time. Um, the hopes in that is that they're able to work daily with those business managers at those at those businesses and to try to solve those problems quickly uh, rather than just being reacting and going to calls for service in those areas. <clears throat> as you guys all know, though, the, uh, the beat officers are, are pretty busy and they're going to calls for service quite a bit. And so um, the chief uh, chief Glover uh, has has done a really good job uh, implementing a new group of police officers uh, as well as professional staff that are part of the chief's office of community policing. Um, that's a, a unit uh, that is assigned to work with patrol and on a daily basis. That's their job is to kind of they will they will work with the patrol officers and the beat officers. Um, to solve problems at an even greater root level because they have a little bit more expertise training and they have some, uh, a little bit of time to be able to solve those issues um, at a really deep level for long term change. And so it's a really good program that um, that we're really excited to have. The, the good part about that is that um, it's not, it's a team effort and that group is not just working with the police department to solve those issues. So the chief's office of community policing can work on a daily basis to work with all the other um, different areas within the city of Tempe with all our partners with ASU 
uh, with the Arizona Department of Transportation, all kinds of uh, different areas to be able to solve those long term issues rather than um, trying to solve it uh, just on our own as a police department. So that kind of goes into a lot of the different aspects of how we're trying to engage the community and uh, bring a community policing strategy to what we're doing each day. All right, thank you, Mike. And uh, the last slide here I'll go ahead and uh, cover is when we're talking about community responders, uh, the first part listed up here, we realize that there is an important role for unbadged, uh, which can refer to as unarmed uh, department representatives that can respond to nonviolent calls for service. And so what we've called them as community responders. They would be trained to respond to such things as vehicle accidents, uh, thefts where there may not be a suspect that's present, uh, loose animal calls, parking violations, uh, and they'd also assist with other areas of community engagement. We do expect that these positions uh, will increase our total uh, service and responsiveness to the community, and we also believe that it'll help to redistribute obligations from our officers so that they can focus on other aspects of community policing as well. So. Uh, we are going to be accepting applications for that. So certainly if anyone here knows of anyone that is interested uh, in something like that, or you want to look for more information, please do not hesitate to uh, visit the Tempe Police Department website. Second part I wanted to uh, touch on is Solari. And we have collaborated with this uh, agency referred to as Solari uh, where they embed crisis responders into our dispatch center, uh, our 911 center. And what is great about that is they're able to divert some of the calls directly over to a very highly trained professional right at the moment uh, that a person is on the call to get resources to someone that may be having a mental health crisis, but otherwise is not necessarily a danger to others or doesn't necessarily immediately need a police response. So again, a lot of times us being able to uh, work smart and utilize those resources and get people in touch with the professionals that they need to be in touch with. Uh, and then lastly is a mental health squad. Uh, we want to, we understand that there are gonna be times where a person is gonna need to be visited uh, by law enforcement, by, by policing units that wanna check on their welfare. Um, and maybe, uh, maybe Solari, uh, you know, for someone that may be having a weapon or something like that, um, it's not appropriate for uh, someone that's unarmed to be going to that situation. But we also want very highly specialized, highly trained officers going to those scenes to uh, de-escalate everything and again, get people the help that they need. And what we wanna do is we wanna create a mental health squad. A highly specialized team to respond to these situations where someone's in crisis and uh, we are seeing an increase in calls where someone could benefit from mental health outreach. So certainly, uh, like others have uh, mentioned as well, we appreciate the efforts of human services uh, as a valuable resource uh, to, to find more sustainable solutions as well. So. Certainly, if anyone has any questions or comments for us, uh, please let us know. Uh, there is a contact information there on the next slide to Molly Enright, and I'm sure many people on this call know Molly and know how awesome she is uh, and how great it is for her to be a, a, on, on the team here. So um, thank you to Molly for uh, all your assistance. And Council Member Adams, thank you for hosting this, uh, for all your support and uh, you and your council colleagues. Uh, certainly, if anyone has any questions for us, let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to answer them. Very good. I really, uh, really appreciate uh, everyone's presentation so far tonight. It's going great. And I know that we can't have, normally I like to be out in the community and have the meetings face to face, but obviously with this COVID business, it's really put a damper on it. But as soon as I can get back out there in person um, with people, I will be, I will be back out there. And I just really appreciate uh, the police and human services being here tonight and uh, great presentation. So we might have some questions that come up in the chat. If we do, um, we can direct them to uh, whomever uh, is, uh, is uh, it, re it re relates to. So uh, anyway, with that, um, I will turn it over to our uh, deputy city manager, Rosa and Chastain. Rosa? Thank you, council member. Adams and good evening everyone. First and foremost to our guests that are here tonight. Thank you for joining us. 
Um, we, we couldn't do this without you. And, uh, I think council member Adams knows the importance and, uh, of dialogue with our community to make sure that we have a pulse on everything that's going on in our, in our city. Um, thanks to our staff, uh, for sharing their knowledge and expertise, uh, because as you know, they have been working this for quite some time as council member Adams says said most of us started in the city many, many years ago in different positions and we worked our way into different positions. So the good thing for all of us is that we get to know not only our jobs presently, but other departments we worked in and also the community because we most of us live here in Tempe. So as Jennifer, as council member Adams mentioned, uh, my role is as deputy city manager and I wanted to say, as she has mentioned, these platforms are very tough, obviously, for dialogue and engagement, but I off the bat, I want to share with all of you that uh, Mayor Woods has been hosting um, some meetings in North Tempe. And actually, we have another one um, scheduled for February 26 in person, and that's a Saturday at 3 o'clock on, on in the cul-de-sac of Sunset Drive there, and we can put more information out to the residents. Because I know it's very frustrating not to be able to engage in different ways. And I just wanted to share that with all of you uh, that you're more than welcome. And I hope that you do show up because I'd love to meet you face to face and have some conversations about the things that are worrying you. I always say I've been a resident uh, of Tempe for 30 years and uh, actually an employee of 29 years. So this is not just a job. This is, uh, this is something that I'm dedicated to. So. In brief, I don't want to create a PowerPoint or, or do any of that. I think our colleagues have shared a lot of data points and information, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit about what's changing in our city. And most definitely, um, one of the things that we have noticed with two years of disease and distrust in our nation is the importance of building trust and building trust with our community and, and, and within our departments regarding what community safety, what feeling safety feels like to different people. And we know uh, we just had a meeting in North Tempe in one of the apartment complex and many people had a variety of perspective of what they felt safe, um, whether they felt safe working, walking in the dark in the parking lot or some of them approaching um, someone perhaps who is homeless and uh, speaking to themselves and some people were comfortable with that and others were not. And I am glad to say that it is as uh, you have heard here, it is really a group effort because what we say is community safety is not just about the police department stepping in. It is a responsibility of all our departments and our community to make sure that we communicate as far as what is needed. So one of the things that hasn't been stated yet, but I wanted to share with all of you in North Tempe, um, you know that sometimes it's very difficult to acquire land. We're only 39 square miles and we're in the process of looking of where we could have an additional substation in North Tempe. Uh, we're also looking at fire department needs another station um, and all those are planning for growth. But until then, we wanted to find out if there was opportunities to create a tenant space that cr creates a space um, for our HOPE team. Um, first and foremost, to, to help provide service right in the nucleus of that area, along with our police department. Um, so on 1462 North Scottsdale Road, um, starting March 1st, that space will be there available to our staff. Um, but more importantly, it is just an opportunity to engage with the residents and to be there available um, to respond to all the, the needs of that community. So that was one of the uh, initiatives that came out actually of neighborhood conversations. Um, um, and that actually came out about seven months ago during those conversations. So if you ever think that that things are not taken seriously, um, please know that we are listening and we are responding to the needs of our community. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with all of you, there's a lot of things that we're working on. And one of them is recognizing that the unsheltered or homeless uh, issues are not just a Tempe. We recognize that it's it's a state issue, it's a local issue, it's a national issue. If you have traveled outside the state in Seattle and, and California, you, you you see these encampments and, and the struggles um, many cities are having. And um, we have now started, actually today, we have engaged Mayor Bloomberg out of New York has created a think tank um, from Harvard who are um, have selected Tempe 
um, to work uh, this coming year. We started today uh, to look at innovative ways to approach unsheltered. And it's almost starting from scratch. Um, not to say that our staff is not working fast and furiously. They are doing everything they can. It's just we know that this nation as a whole needs to start thinking differently about what is going on in our communities. Um, so one of the outcomes, and I always talk about outcomes, what can you expect? We talked today about there will be two things that are pilots that are innovative that we are going to have to implement in Tempe, and we want to. That's why we signed up to do this. So staff is working on that, and that is various departments from the fire department to human services, police department. Um, so our parks, because we know that, that there are many um, unsheltered in our parks. So please know that um, these, these concerns of yours uh, are taken seriously and that we're approaching this from all types of lenses. Um, so with that, Council Member Adams, I will turn it back to you and see if there's any questions that I can help answer or, or explore. I, I really, I really uh, appreciate uh, your feedback and, you know, the Bloomberg, you know, that's because of your efforts, Rosa. And maybe people don't know that, but um, it's because of you that we've got Bloomberg and, and we're working with Harvard now and um, all, all of that. So I was really proud of uh, the direction that the city's going. We are seen as a leader in the entire country for how we're addressing homelessness and affordable housing and all those other um, challenges that we have. We do need to have this be a regional approach. We need to get Chandler and Scottsdale and Mesa Ahmed and Phoenix on board with us. We can work together because the homeless just don't just all come to Tempe. You know, they're everywhere. So we need to have a regional approach. So I'm, I'm really excited about that and, and um, how we're doing things. I'm excited about that we've expanded, expanded our HOPE efforts. I know that we're also, um, I encourage um, partnering, continuing with TCAA and so we can work with them and, and just keep getting the benefits out there in the homeless house and take care of both the homeless and the, the people that are homeless in our community. And I, I know we can do that. And you and your team are doing a great job and the police is doing great, human services is doing great. So I just can't thank you enough for all your efforts. So thank you so much. Thank you, Council Member Adams. I appreciate that. So with that, um, I'm going to do my top 10. Um, and I know that we do have some, uh, you know, some chat. And so if there's chat questions, we will get to you. And I, I really wish this could be, uh, you know, in person, but uh, hopefully next time we'll be in person. So for my top 10, here's what's happening in 85281. So number 10, North Tempe Character Area Plan. The North Tempe Character Area Plan is, is approved. It was approved on December 9th. So very excited to, to um, you know, uh, focus on what the community wants and, and how they want their land used up there. And it's gonna be used by boards, commissions, and Tempe City Council. So if you wanna find out more about your character area, it's tempe.gov forward slash character areas. That's tempe.gov forward slash character areas. Number nine, the city continues to do COVID vaccinations and booster, booster shots at schools, churches, and nonprofit organizations around the city. That's another thing that uh, Rose and Chelsea has uh, taken the lead on. Um, so we're getting out there, we're getting people vaccinated. It's been enormously uh, effective. So if you want to um, check that out, it's tempe.gov forward slash coronavirus. Number eight, sports complex RFP in process. So there is um, there is a RFP out there. Um, and so that is, that's gonna be at tempe.gov forward slash priest RFP. So that's, uh, they're looking at a, a sports complex um, renovation. Number seven, more help for the homeless has been approved as we've talked about tonight. We've gone from nine staff to 11 staff. Also the um, Arizona State University is paying for two of those staffs members. So that's that's really exciting that we're starting to partner more closely with ASU and we need to keep that going. That's for sure. Uh, number six is the county island development. Um, many of you know that I led the effort to annex uh, the county island and I continue to work with people that are involved or interested in developing it even further. I'd like to see some public spaces out there, a nice park, um, just all kinds of really good things. Dog park, um, I know with the new banding project that's going on, that is at uh, Curry and Miller Road, and that's the 17 acres on the far east side. 
And with that, they're going to have a couple dog parks in there also in there in that complex. So we have 17 acres annexed with 60 to go. So we're working on making our way and kind of cascading it down down towards Scottsdale Road. Um, number five is park update. We are looking at uh, more more park uh, next for um, for updating it and, and fixing it up. If you're interested in giving providing feedback, you can go to tempe.gov forward slash park updates. Number four, if you're going on a road trip around Tempe, um, we want you to get there fast. So check check out tempe.gov forward slash street closure so you don't get stuck in, in traffic. Um, we've uh, been able to secure more money into our pavement improvement projects. I'm uh, proud that um, I was one of the uh, persons that led that effort because our pavements have been falling apart for many years now, but we're starting to get more pavement projects. So with that, that's temporary. Uh, you know, problem with, with traffic, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. So just go ahead and go to that road closures, then you can find out so, um, where, where, the, where the construction's happening so you don't get stuck. Number three, uh, residential garbage collection delays. So we had, we've been hit very hard with COVID in our solid waste division, um, which affects your garbage. So what we're asking is if your garbage does not pick, get picked up on the day it's supposed to, leave it out there and, and hopefully the next day it will be picked up. So um, don't forget about uh, just leaving it out there and we'll get, get through it as soon as we can. We've, got, we've lost a lot of staff. Uh, coronavirus has been really hurtful, but we feel like we're on the road to recovery now. We've hired a lot more staff and I think we're gonna be very successful in picking up your garbage on time. So that's, uh, that's just about the delays. And if you wanna, if you have questions, you can go to tempe.gov forward slash solid waste. Uh, to check out what's happening, or you can give them a call at 3540-350-4311. If your garbage has been picked up for a few days, just go ahead and, and uh, reach out to them and, and let them know that um, for, perhaps your can was even missed. That can't happen. They pick up an enormous amount of garbage uh, um, all the time in our city, so and they do a great job. Also, the city of Tempe is hiring for positions, so if you're interested in becoming um, a city worker, you can go to tempe.gov forward slash jobs and uh, check that out because we've got a lot of openings now. I would really encourage people to apply. It's a great place to work and uh, just, uh, um, you know, we need people. So uh, check that out. And number one, uh, North Tempe calendar. I wanted to go over some important dates with uh, on my North Tempe folks. Uh, the second Sunday's on Mill. Um, March 13th is the next one that's uh, on Mill Avenue. You can go down there. I've been down there. It's really fun. You can walk around um, the street. They have different um, uh, people that uh, are selling very, all kinds of different things. It's really fun. It's, you, they think of things that you never even thought of. So I would encourage you to check it out. It's nice, nice weather right now to walk down around there. Um, the Festival of the Arts is coming uh, March 25th through the 27th. That's on Mill Avenue. So uh, mark your date on that. That's always fun to go to too. I usually take my dog with me. Um, and then there's Arizona Dragon Boat Festival and that's March 26th through the 27th. That's uh, on uh, Town Lake Marina. And then the second Sunday's on mail will be April 10th uh, for the next one. So um, if you wanna check out all the events that are happening, you can go to tempe.gov forward slash calendar and uh, find out what's happening. Um, so with that, uh, does anyone have uh, any other comments on the staff? Hey, okay. Jennifer, I'm going to just put up, uh, share my screen as soon as I made oh. a presenter with the contact information for you and I, in case people want to send us anything. Okay. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And uh, we covered a lot of information tonight. I know, I know we did and, and everyone was very efficient with their time tonight. I'm impressed. And uh, if no one else has anything else, uh, Kristen, do you have anything or anyone else or we'll close it up? I don't have anything, Council Member Adam. Okay, all right. Well, very good then. I wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day and I hope to uh, see you uh, next time in person. So thanks and have a great night. If people want to stay on, we'll get that contact slide up right now. Just bear with us. <laughs>